Thank you, and welcome, Professor Colby and Baker. Uh, we are very pleased to hear from you on your summary of findings on the people waiting um, uh, score for education funding in Vermont. We're here today with the House Education Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee. No, other than just to say good morning to everybody and uh, looking forward to hearing the findings and appreciate the fact that you're doing this with 22 House members. Um, we, we will do our best to get the presentation out there and get, get people a chance to ask questions. And I know both committees are going to have some time with you uh, later as well. So if there are follow-up questions, we'll be able to do that. But thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you to Representative Webb and Nancy for inviting us. Um, I'm here today with uh, Dr. Bruce Baker, and my name is Tian Colby. Um, I'm an associate professor at the University of Vermont in the Evolution of Policy Program. Um, uh, Bruce and I are representing a larger team of people, which includes our colleagues, uh, Drew Atchison and Jesse Levin at the American Institutes for Research. And as a team, um, we uh, took on this task of evaluating the people waiting formula that's included in the existing school funding bill uh, and statute of Vermont. Um, today, the purpose of today is to provide a high-level overview of the waiting study. Uh, we, want to, we want to highlight the questions that we asked, how we answered those questions, and key findings. Um, I'm sure most of you have had a chance to start to read the report. There's lots in there, um, to say the least. And so our goal is to, is to set a baseline with respect to what the high-level findings are. And again, as you, as you indicated, I think there'll be other opportunities for us to go more in depth. Um, but what we're hoping to do is by providing a high level today that we can establish sort of a general conversation around the report, and then we can go more specific later. Um, the report is very comprehensive. Um, it was our intent to look at the issues and the questions that the General Assembly posed in a very systematic and comprehensive way. And um, again, we'll be looking at findings in more depth as we go along. Um, Bruce and I are going to share the presentation today, um, both because it's a treat to have Bruce here. Bruce came up last night, um, drove again this morning from New Jersey, from Rutgers University, and uh, also to save my voice a bit. So you're going to hear from both of us this morning. Um, and so I'm going to start by introducing you, and we'll go back and forth as the day goes on. But feel free to draw questions at either of us at any time. So just start out with. Um, the way it's studied it was in response to a legislative request, um, and the Vermont Agency of Education was directed um, in Act 173 to undertake a study that examines and evaluates three things. The current weights for economically disadvantaged students, ELL students, and secondary level students, and whether those weights should be modified. Whether or not there's a need for new cost factors and weights to be incorporated into equalized pupil calculation, and three, uh, the extent to which the special education census block grant should be adjusted for differences in incidence and costs associated with students with disabilities across school districts. So those were the, those were the guideposts for this, and those guideposts were put out um, in the legislative request. Our study contained, our study, we approached the study with six key objectives, right? So we had the legislative request, but we then sort of honed that around six key objectives. Um, and that was, and the intent with these objectives was contextualize sort of the Vermont policies that we have now in light of the best thinking on how to design effective state level school finance systems, um, to capture the insights and voices from the field in Vermont um, as we contemplate potential next steps. Um, for Vermont policymaking, and to leverage national, regional, and state data to evaluate Vermont's current policies. And so with that backdrop, right, we had these six objectives. The first one was to develop a national profile of cost factors and funding mechanisms used in state education funding formula. <coughs> Two, to obtain stakeholder perceptions and experiences with existing funding formula. Three, identify aspects of student need and local educational context that account for differences in the cost of educating students to common standards. You can hear us talk about that a lot today. Educating to common standards. Four, to empirically derive weights for a select set of cost factors that can be included in Vermont school funding formula. We're also going to hear that, that language quite a bit today about empirically deriving as opposed to just sort of coming up with a number. Uh, five, assessing further adjustments to the census-based special education block grant and whether, whether those are needed. 
and if they are needed, what they might look like. And six, developing simulations that can be used to predict the effect of various changes to the funding formula. I know oftentimes when we talk, particularly around school funding, we talk about, you know, what happens if we do X or Y? Part of our task, as we saw it, was to do our best to simulate what potential changes might look like on a town by town, district by district basis. Um, so our goal with all of this is to provide a synthetic accounting of the findings, right? You'll notice that the report doesn't sort of go six objectives, right? We don't talk about it that way. Our goal is to be very synthetic and say, sort of, what does all of this tell us about what the status, sort of the state of the, state of the field looks like? And with the goal of providing actionable evidence that you can use in decision making, right? So our focus in all of our work was on what is it that we thought that we can provide to you that's actionable for decision making. Um, and so I'm going to hand it off to Bruce now. And Bruce is going to talk a little bit about, set, is going to help set a common understanding for the purpose and design of how we think about cost differences in the school funding formula and why we think about it that way. And the intent behind that is to set a baseline level of understanding about what, what the broad range of policy options might look like in thinking through potential reforms to Vermont. Okay. So when, when we, in, uh, in this kind of weird field of studying school finance policy and, <coughs> and the design of these state school finance systems to provide resources to schools, districts, and the students that they serve, we look at these systems in terms of trying to provide for equal educational opportunity to all children. When we, when we try to kind of operationalize a definition of equal educational opportunity, we, we do that in terms of opportunities to achieve given outcome goals. And a lot of this comes out of, kind of the, the emergent you know, last several decades of education policy where we move toward measuring outcomes, holding schools and districts accountable for different outcome measures, and, and ideally getting students to certain outcome goals through the K-12 system so that they can persist and complete in higher ed, have equal opportunity beyond the K-12 system. So we frame um, the, the analyses, we frame our policy goals in terms of ensuring equal educational opportunities for all students, and, and then we tend to operationalize that in terms of equal opportunity to achieve certain measured outcome objectives, measured outcome objectives that we perceive to be important and useful for kind of predicting later life outcomes for, for all, all students. Students come to school, as the slide said, students come to school with, with different backgrounds, um, different, different learning needs, different, and some of these operate at the individual student level, some of these are about the broader social context of schooling, which we'll hit on the uh, next slide. Um, and these different backgrounds require different levels and different mixes of educational resources to give these kids equal opportunity to achieve the same outcomes um, from one setting to another. Um, it also happens to be the case that the costs associated with bringing certain students to certain outcome goals may differ from one setting to the next. And that those things may actually interact, that a, a high poverty student population in a small, remote, rural setting may have different costs associated with achieving a common set of outcome goals than a similarly high poverty um, concentration of students um, in a larger city or town. So we try to look at how all these factors interact so that we can figure out how much more or less would be needed here versus here for this child versus that child to give them equal opportunity to get to whatever the outcome goal may be. Can take that. So we, we kind of broke these out into boxes um, to say that there are specific individual student factors. We talk about these as, as, as risk factors leading into the empirical analysis because these are the factors that if, if a student comes to school, for example, with limited English speaking skills, there is a greater likelihood that that student, at least for that time, will do less well on the measured outcomes that we're looking at. It is a risk of doing less well on the measured outcome. Students with disabilities at varying degrees of severity are likely to not perform as well on the measured outcomes. And, and in that sense, it's a, it's a risk factor, not to cast it as too negative, but it's in the sense of it poses a greater risk of a lower outcome on the measure of interest and therefore requires that we look at some approach to mitigating that risk. And the approach we're looking at here is what levels of funding are needed to provide the resources, programs, and services 
that might help to bring those kids to the same outcomes. Some of them are specific educational needs like disability status or English language learners where it's, it, it, we, we know which kids have which needs and what types of services they would need to mitigate the risk and most often that translates to additional staff with additional qualifications, um, smaller ratios that lead to greater costs. There are also broader factors, um, which we heard about in kind of social context factors. Um, which, when we talk about the you know, concentration of poverty in schools, it's not that any one child who qualifies for a free or reduced lunch under the National School Lunch Program has a specific identifiable educational need, as with ELL students or special education <coughs> students, but that a school that's serving 50, 60, 70 percent children who are from low-income families has generally different needs, may need to provide smaller classes, additional support services, um, than a school that has 5, 10, or 15 percent low-income children if we're striving to achieve <coughs> the So class size, broad general strategies to mitigate the risk of this kind of higher poverty social context. And we know that we've had dramatically increases dramatic increases in child poverty in certain parts of the state over the last several decades. Um, <coughs> some of the major factors that are school and district structural factors. I should have gotten beautiful. No, I'm sorry. Economies is one of the biggest drivers of differences in costs um, from, from research over time. And it, economies of scale. Very small schools and districts operate at much higher costs of achieving the same outcome goals. Um, and there's a substantial body of research on that. And it also interacts with population sparsity, which is, to an extent, a primary determinant of, of things like transportation costs as, as part of the operating um, budget. So it's district and, and school enrollment size and population sparsity are significant um, factors that may also interact in ways that we don't understand as well with kind of measures of, of rurality, which are different, I'd say, than <coughs> the Vermont context as opposed to looking at West Texas. Um, we also have a number of other geographic factors like uh, geographic variation and competitiveness for employee wages. What does it take to recruit and retain a teacher with the same qualifications in one location versus another, in Chittenden County versus the Northeast Kingdom versus Rutland County? Um, are there differences in what it would take in a teacher wage to get a comparably qualified fifth or sixth grade math teacher in each of those locations? And we can use other kind of external labor market data to try to get a gauge on that. But, but that serves as the frame then, both for the empirical analysis that we conduct and for the approaches that we take in school finance systems to adjust for those. In our report, we're trying to set up an, empir an empirical analysis that can directly inform how you would adjust in the funding formula. But these types of adjustments um, for these different factors, for economies <coughs> of scale, for differences in competitive wages, for low-income children, ELL, and children with disabilities, have existed in school <coughs> finance formulas across the country for a number of years because we've known <coughs> that they do affect costs. But in, in most states, the, the adjustments to account for those <coughs> factors aren't actually based on any kind of empirical analysis of the costs associated with achieving common outcome goals. So I think this is where I turn it back to Tammy to talk about what's going on in state school funding policy. So nationally, one of the things we did is we did a national scan and said, well, what do other states do? And rather than saying, well, this is how the formula worked, you know, one of the, one of the questions that the General Assembly posed to us was, what kinds of cost factors do other state formula, funding formula take into account? And that's relevant because actually, as we'll talk about in a minute, our state funding formula doesn't take, care, take into account many cost factors, right? We, we have actually a really narrow set of cost factors. And so in summary, what we found was is that <coughs> And you break out cost factors again by the typology that Dr. Breaker suggested. In terms of student need, we find that all states include some sort of adjustment for the differences in costs associated with students with disabilities. 47 states adjust for differences in costs associated with various levels of economic disadvantage or at risk students. 48 states adjust for differences in costs associated with educating English language learners to common outcomes. <coughs> 
35 states adjust for differences in cost for gifted intelligence students. And 32 states include some sort of grade level adjustment, and that is they acknowledge that the cost of providing education at different grade levels may, not, may be different. Under scale and sparsity, and I know this is of particular interest to this group, is 33 states in the country right now recognize that small districts in schools and those located in sparsely populated areas face higher approved people costs. 11 states identify districts and schools solely based on size. One state identifies districts solely based on population density. And 21 states condition aid for small schools on being geographically necessary. That is, they're both small and geographically isolated. So it, it, it's a two-part test. And then third, 11 states incorporate some sort of regional cost adjustment, and frankly these are larger states and states that have very different teacher labor markets, for example Maryland, and what they're doing is primarily adjusting for differences in teacher wages across the states. All states rely, though, in thinking about adjusting for cost differences, all states use different mechanisms. So we're going to talk a lot about gaming today, but I think it's important to understand that there's a, there's a toolkit that, that policymakers can use. It's not just about people waiting. There are different ways you can do this. We can think about single student waits, which is essentially what we have right now in Vermont, or some sort of per capita stipend amount, which is a dollar amount per student with particular characteristics. That's one policy option. Another policy option is some sort of radiation of weight within the category that says, based on, certain, for example, certain concentrations of poverty in a district, right? there is a different weight depending on the concentration of poverty. We have resource-based allocations, which allocate funding, additional funding based on, number, on sort of staffing profiles and assumptions. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Assumptions about staffing. I'm worried I'm going to dump that right on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> We've all had that moment, right? Um, and so rather than allocating on weights or some sort of dollars, they say, well, we're going to allocate additional resources based on some ideal staffing profile, but we think that might cost. We've cost reimbursement, which is what historically we've used in Vermont for special education. And then we have catalogable grant programs, which are dedicated, targeted, specific dollars for specific purposes, right, that operate oftentimes outside the funding formula. So I, we offer this up as sort of, again, a, a way, a, a framework for thinking about larger questions around school finance policy before we launch into the waiting study specifically in our findings because the goal is to help policymakers think about what are the tools in the toolkit that you have at hand. So as we move forward, we want to talk a little bit about Vermont's policy. Now there's lots of school, there's, Vermont school funding policy is complicated and there are lots of moving pieces. There are a couple of things that we wanted to highlight before in, in this conversation. And specifically, just reminding ourselves of what the Bergen decision asked us to do. And that was to provide, ensure substantial equal levels of tax effort for equal levels of school spending. And also that the wealth of the state should pay for educational spending, not individual towns. Right? So that's, those are kind of guardrails, right, that the Brigham decision provides. <coughs> Um, with respect to Vermont, Vermont's policy, though, for how we make adjustments for cost differences, particularly in the context of our waiting system, operates fundamentally differently than most other states. Most states use something called a foundation formula, where there's a base amount that the state sets, and then they make assumptions about the additional cost <coughs> that above that base amount for differences in student need within a particular school or district. That's not how we work, right? And so when we talk, with, when you look at other states and you think about the weights used in other state formulas, those weights operate very differently than the weights operate here in this state. And we really want to stress that at the outset because it makes some of these state-by-state -state comparisons really tricky. And one of the things that undoubtedly will happen in a discussion around this report is people will try to make these comparisons. And so we want to make sure that we caution everybody that we have an apples and oranges comparison here when we start to think about other states. And what the weights do in Vermont's formula, right? Well, let me back up. When Vermont's formula is fundamentally different in that it is the local school, right? The local town that establishes spending. 
And the assumption is that local schools and local towns and districts are going to make appropriate adjustments in their budgets for differences in educational costs. Right? So think about that. Right? The assumption in the formula is, through local control, that a district is going to look at their population, think about the needs of those populations, right? think about what resources need to be in place in that district that, that can ensure all students reach common outcomes, and then they set a budget. And then that budget is funded right through our statewide property tax, and the price that they pay for that, those additional costs that they might have, right, are discounted through the weighting, right, through our equalized pupil calculation, and that impacts tax capacity. It does not generate additional revenue, state revenue, and that's the other thing I think that's really important for all of us to keep in the back of our heads, and that's different than other states. The weights in our formula don't do not create additional revenue per se. What they're doing is they're creating additional tax capacity at the local level to pay for differences in costs. And those differences in costs are presumed to be reflected in local school district budgets. So when a school principal pulls the budget together, the assumption is that that school principal has thought carefully about what all the package of resources need to be to make sure that all kids reach a certain outcome, and that the cost of those resources are in the budget, and then we equalize tax effort, right, with regard to paying for that across all districts in the state through the weights. That is really a different, very different from what other states do. So we need to keep that in the back of our mind. The second, second thing we have to recognize is that that's our formula, but we need to step back and think about what is Vermont school funding policy. And our policy in and of itself is comprised of many different parts. And the two parts we want to highlight is not just the formula and the weights, but also the categorical programs. Because we have, because we have categorical programs that provide specific targeted aid to school districts that are intended to offset cost differences. So some of our cost adjustments, right, when we talk about what we the framework, some of our cost adjustments are through the weights that are in the formula. Some of them come in, right, some of them come into play in the context of these categorical grants. And together, this is our funding policy, right? We have to think of all the pieces at once, not just the weights, but also the categorical grant programs. And so in our formula, in our funding policy, our categorical grants provide supplemental funding for specific programs or services for certain kinds of students, for certain kinds of activities. Those dollars, right, come off the top before a district ed spending number is generated, right? Then we also have the weights that a district, which then we also weight a district's average daily membership for cost factors and use these district weighted, use district weighted membership to equalize per pupil spending for the purposes of local tax rates. That's our funding policy with regard to cost differences. It's not just the weights. We have three primary categorical grant programs. Vermont offers the category for it, the special education grant, the transportation grant, and small schools grant. Special education finance program administers the state's special education funding laws. Um, it's changing, right? Under Act 173, we're transitioning how we will allocate dollars. But that is a categorical grant. It's outside of the other general education funding formula. Transportation aid is available to reimburse the half of school districts' expenditures to transport students to and from school. The exact reimbursement percentage right, varies year to year a little bit, but and, it's, and the total amount is limited by appropriation. But that's also part of our package, because that's intended to offset the cost of operating rural schools, or schools that have higher transportation costs. And then we also have the small school grant um, that awards categorical grant to small schools, um, where the two-year average enrollment is less than 100 students. So these programs provide explicit additional state aid to offset direct expenditures. Then we have our weighting, which, right, where the weights are used to calculate the number of equalized people. And if we can think about the equalized people as, as the average student in terms of educational costs in a school district. Okay, that's, I think that's a helpful way to think about it, that what we're doing is just trying to create average costs. Right? And specifically, the weights implicitly, whereas the categorical rate explicitly adjusts for costs, the weights implicitly adjust for costs. 
and for spending differences by equalizing per people spending across districts, and they impact local tax burden. And again, they don't generate additional revenue, they impact local tax capacity to generate education related revenue. And I think one way you could think about this, and, and I think this is useful as we start to talk about change, potentially changing ways, right? Is assuming, let's assume for a minute that we have the school budget that was voted in your town or your district last spring, right? And we had an equalized number of equalized pupils, right? That determine the tax rate. If that budget was unchanged, right? Everything stays the same, and the number of equalized pupils in the district goes up. The cost per pupil for the district goes down, and that lowers the education-related tax rates. If, again, that budget stays the same, and the number of equalized pupils, right, through waiting, goes down, the cost per pupil in that district goes up, and your education-related tax rates go up. That's how the waiting mechanism works. And, again, I, I want to be clear, that's holding spending constant. Right? This doesn't, this, this gets far more complicated when we have movements not just in spending in a particular district, but everybody's district, because we have a statewide system. And so one of the things we'll talk about when we get to our simulation, it's one of the reasons we need to be careful with those simulation estimates. They're helpful, but they're not, they're not arbitrary in that that's exactly right. We have to make a lot of assumptions around those. We, in our system right now, we have four existing weights. It's a four. One is for economically disadvantaged students, the value of which is 0.25 or 1.25. Uh, English language learners, 1.20. Secondary students, and secondary students are, are, are defined as grades 7 through 12. This isn't high school, it's 7 through 12. And that's 1.13. We have a pre-kindergarten weight of 0.46. A couple things that are important to note here. First, these weights are historic artifacts. That is the best, nicest terminology I can use for them, right? They predate Act 60. In our, in our investigation, we could find no evidence that they were empirically derived. The, the point two five comes from some federal reporter in 1989-90 yeah. where someone looked at average expenditures on mm -hmm. kids in poverty. And a lot of states adopted weights around that mm -hmm. time. Of, and that was national. That and, and it was, it was a national thing, and it was not nobody knows exactly specific. where it came from, yeah. but it became embedded in policies in a number yeah. of states, and here it is. And here it is. So when I say historical <laughs> artifact, I mean 80s historical, flashback to the 80s here, okay? Right, so it's a historical artifact. It's, none of these weights are empirically derived. Why, why am I stressing that? Because in order for weights, and in order for this formula to work well, Right? For, for the formula to do its job to adjust for cost differences, the assumption is, is that the weights are appropriately adjusting for cost differences. If those weights are not, are not doing their job, then we are not appropriately adjusting for cost differences and spending differences across school districts in the state. And that impacts tax capacity, that, which then impacts the local decisions about what they spend, and that, I mean, that just continues on, right? So there's no, these rates are not empirically derived. They're historical artifacts. And frankly, they raise serious questions about the extent to which they are effective with respect to adjusting for cost differences across Vermont school districts. One of the key things we did in our study is we went out and we talked to stakeholders in the field about their perceptions, their experiences with the school funding formula. We thought that's really important because certainly empirically deriving weights is important, but also understanding what implementation looks like is also important. And so we talked to 35 individuals around the state, some of whom were in this room, both here and back here, um, the educational leaders, members of the General Assembly, members of um, representative uh, educational organizations and organizational leadership and fiscal staff at AOE. And there was remarkable agreement across this group of individuals around six items. One, the cost factors, and those are the thing, those are those things that we adjust on, not the weights themselves, but you know, just whether what we adjust on, um, do not reflect current educational circumstances. That they don't that simply adjusting for poverty, ELL, and grade level, which is isn't really capturing very well 
what accounts for the real, so the boots on the ground differences in educational costs around dist across districts in the state. Second, the values of the existing weights, ELL, poverty, our grade level weights, um, have weak ties with the actual differences in cost of education to students, which is not particularly surprising since they weren't empirically derived in the first place. Three, the state's small school grant program is problematic in its design and current operation, and I think we can safely say there was uniform frustration among every single stakeholder, among the stakeholders with the existing program. Four, there is a need for specific and targeted grant aid, categorical grant aid, to support schools struggling to meet different and increased levels of student need due, due to childhood trauma and mental health concerns. Right? That, that bubbled up too. We also asked stakeholders about the special education block grant calculation. Um, as you all know, right, there's been a lot of conversation around so is the existing calculation fair? What are the potential implications of that calculation? And so we talked to stakeholders and said, what do you think about that? Um, it, stakeholder reactions were mixed um, <coughs> on the need for potential adjustments at this time. And I'm going to be real clear about at this time. Um, at one of the continuum, we had one person say, the sky's not going to fall. At the other end of the continuum, we had someone say, the correlation between poverty and disability is really strong, and we have to think about that. And somewhere in the middle, we have people saying, and then again, these quotes sort of typify, it's too soon to tell whether the grant will be a problem. And to that last point, what we heard is even among stakeholders who are concerned whether or not the grant's going to be sufficient or equitable, there also was this recognition that the census grant and the concerns around the census grant were actually very closely tied to concerns around how student poverty is weighted in the general education formula. Mm -hmm. In that, in districts with, in districts and places where there were particular concerns around the census block grant, some of that concern actually was with respect to that they felt as if they were unable to spend enough on the general education side for students in poverty and that those costs had been spilling over into the special education right, fund. And so there was a sense that if there were adjustments to, for example, the poverty weight, that that might stem some of the tide with regard to concerns on the census block rate. I think that's an important thing to consider as we go forward. Um, and again, that's not to say there weren't concerns, but the concerns were mixed. And there was a general sense, in, there was a general sense among all stakeholders, is that concerns were most strongly related to the uncertainty with how the grant is going to be implemented. There's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of unknowns <coughs> still, right? The working group is still working on some of the implementation, and so there was a lot of questions like, "Well, we think it might be this, and if it was that, then I would be concerned, but I don't know it's going to be that, and so that I'm not sure if I'm concerned, right?" So. That, and just to give you a fair appraisal of what the stakeholders said. I just said, I was my member that does have a question. Okay. Um, j just a quick one. Go back to the weights and, and talk about the fact that those are kind of historical. Yep. Uh, this slide, existing weights? Uh, yes, existing yeah. weights. Just curious about the pre-K weight of 0.46, since that was more recently derived. I'm just wondering if that was empirical that was at all. Not, that was not part of our study, right? The pre-K was not, so we didn't evaluate that weight. Um, okay, so you, our, you wouldn't categorize it as the other ones as being quite so historic. Whether or not it's empirically derived, you didn't look into. We did not look into it's that. Not it, as and it's true. much, it, right, and that weight has been enacted. Much more, much more recently. So the economic disadvantage, the weight for economically disadvantaged students and ELL students are holdovers from pre-X60. They haven't been changed since before X60. Secondary students, um, that weight was adjusted um, in 2007. Um, it's actually decreased about, about half to 1.13. The Agency of Education evaluated that um, and by looking at sort of the ratio of um, elementary school spending versus secondary spending. They thought that 1.18 is what they saw there. Um, so that's as close as any kind of empirical derivation that we have for that way. The 0.46? No, the secondary students. Oh, I'm sorry. But the 0.46, yeah. that was not something we focused on in our discussion. Okay. Thanks. Okay, does that help? Yeah, that's clarifying. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Quickly, the stakeholder perspectives on small school grants. 
Um, as I said, stakeholders are uniformly opposed to continuing the small school grant program as it currently, as it currently stands. Whether it's one stakeholder that I thought would be particularly powerful, particularly powerful, everyone is looking for a better way forward. I see some nodding. <laughs> Um, nearly all interview participants view the small schools grant program as fundamentally at odds with the policy goals articulated in Act 46. Um, and there was general agreement, however, though, that the state needs to support geographically necessary small schools, right? That while the existing grant program is at odds with Act 46, there was broad agreement among stakeholders that we have geographically necessarily geographically necessary small schools and that we have an obligation as a state to support them. Just might not be through the small schools grant program, as it currently is. Um, and in general, stakeholders were uh, felt that incorporating weights for school size and rurality in the equalized pupil calculation would alleviate concerns related to eliminating a small schools grant program. Is that it? Uh, yeah, Shai. Thank you. Shai. Is, is there somewhere defined geographically necessary? So that's, that's a good question. So I think that that certainly is a normative concept, what, at what threshold. And so one of the things we'll talk about in, in our empirical analysis is we started to look at that in terms of population density, and we looked at what thresholds at which um, thresholds for population density at which costs start to change. And so we use those we use those parameters to start thinking about that. Dr. Baker? Right. At, at, at the point where population density no longer seems to have an effect on cost at the same time as size, that's where we saw them kind of phasing out. Now, the, 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 the trick is, you know, if you're doing this as empirical analysis, it's all on these nice kind of continuous curves. When we start trying to derive this in policy, we want to draw bright lines through it, and you've got to figure out, well, where are you going to draw that line, and who's going to fall just above and just below that line? Um, but, so we have some guidance from the report. That's not to suggest that the cuts that we made in the data are you know, what should absolutely be the policy, but that they were points where we saw that <coughs> Enrollment by sparsity related cost <coughs> seemed to taper off to not necessarily being different than a, than a non sparse, non small school. Um, and we have that in the economies of scale literature more broadly every time that we know that school districts at the district level, um, districts achieve kind of scale economies at you know, anywhere from 1,200 to 2,000 students. But the costs don't sharply go up until you get to districts with 300 or fewer students, and even more sharply with 100 or fewer students. So in those ranges where you're between 1,200 and 2,000, or even 1,200 to 1,500, it's, it's kind of going up at a gradual curve. At what point do you decide we need to step in with policy to account for this? Otherwise, it's simply unfair. And we, we interacted that with population sparsity so that we could couple those decisions. We say, well, this is a this is a cluster of small schools that are in a non-sparse area. Would we want to be subsidizing that at a higher rate? It's a great question. I think it sort of foreshadows some of the discussion yeah. and debate that policymakers are going to have around the findings. And one of the things we try to do in the studies, we did do some simulations, but we made some assumptions there, and those are supposed to be illustrative, but not sort of hard and fast, and we look forward to hearing the discussion around those. But I want to just, let's hold questions, if you could just make a note on the page that, that you want to ask a question, just want to make sure that we have a chance to do. Two other considerations identified stakeholders that bubbled up that we wanted to know is um, there were frequently voiced concerns around the impact of Vermont's early college program on a district's long-term membership. Um, and the general consensus being that the way the ECP works right now is that when a student enrolls in early college, they come out of the count entirely. But what we heard from school districts is that school districts continue to serve these students. They continue to receive guidance services. They continue to participate in extracurriculars. They're, they're not zero cost the district anymore. Um, and that there were some concerns around that, and there were suggestions that there may be an opportunity to think of those students as a fraction of a full-time equivalent student. The second thing is a bigger issue, and it, it really strikes sort of at the heart of how our funding system is set up, um, but we wanted to make sure that we highlighted it because it came up quite a few times. 
is that there's this underlying concern that any efforts to update the equalized people calculations, so right, we, we do all the hard policy and the political work of updating the weights, to in, the goal of introducing more equity in the system may not actually translate to increased levels of spending. Right? So the idea was we're trying to do this work with the weights so that dis the districts with higher needs students allocate sufficient resources. But remember when I started out, districts still get to decide what they spend. right? And so it could be that a district's equalized pupil count goes up, remember those arrows, and their tax rate goes down. And instead of using that tax capacity to spend more on students to write equalized outcomes or to close spending gaps, the local, the local, the local um, voters decide to take that as a tax cut and continue to spend at the same level. We heard that a lot. It's a thorny issue. I'll just say that. But we felt that since we heard it so many times that it was important to share that with policymakers that that is a concern that around this report and the report's findings. So we turn it back to Bruce to talk about the weights. We really took we. The, the approach that we took in this project really kind of hits it from both ends. On the one hand, we went out and talked to people to figure out you know, how do they feel, what do they think of the problems with the formula, and then we flew back up to at least 10,000 feet to gather a whole bunch of data and run a whole bunch of messy, complicated models to try to figure out you know, what should a weighting structure look like to provide equal opportunity to achieve the outcome measures that we have. Um, and we. So, and, but we still had to kind of go back and fit that to the concept behind the Vermont formula, which is to use this to generate some kind of a weighted equalized pupil count, which would then be used to, in, in effect, you know, provide for the increased capacity to raise the tax dollars to get to that money that would be needed to serve the needier population where you to, you know, at least stay at the same tax rate or even increase toward a, a competitive tax rate with those around you, which is... I mean, there's a whole lot of kind of economic theory about what the behavior of towns would be in the shifting of their tax rates under these circumstances. We didn't get there in the report. So the approach that we took on the next slide is you know, one of the really important things that we often forget to do in, in this type of cost modeling is, is to actually assess, well, what are all the different measures that we have in a state that capture differences in child <coughs> economic disadvantage? Um, what are the different measures we might have on students who are English language learners? Do we have any greater level of kind of precision in the data on the degrees of severity and prevalence of disabilities? You know, what, what are the different types of measures that we might have? We had a number of different types of measures to capture the, uh, the shares of low income children across schools in the state um, that might yield different weights depending on how we on how we estimate the model, we wanted to start with this risk analysis to figure out, well, is it, the, is it the percent of children who qualify for subsidized lunch, free plus reduced lunch, would be the, the children who are from families that are below the 185% income threshold for poverty, as opposed to the district kind of child poverty index measure that we have in Vermont, which is at a somewhat lower threshold, but not at the census poverty threshold. Um, uh, versus, and, and then even using different sources of data can give you different kind of degrees of precision. We use data from the National Center for Education Statistics over a multi-year period and then use those data to kind of predict in the empty spaces from their data set for free or reduced lunch at the school level, as well as using the state's own AOE collected free and reduced lunch level. So it was kind of a weird thing for me to find in our risk analysis that the, the stronger correlation um, between the low income measures and the various kind of test score student outcome measures was with the National Center for Education Statistics measure um, and student outcomes as opposed to the state measure. In most states, we find much greater kind of precision on the state, state collected measures. But I think it was the multiple years of data and the way that we used kind of predicted values to fill in the blanks um, and the fact that we might have some kind of ceiling effect with community eligibility reporting. Um, so one of the really important things at that stage of the analysis, though, is to find the measures that pick up the variation across districts. Right? Find that if sometimes you know, in a state that is generally very high in poverty concentration, using a measure that's at a lower 
income threshold can pick up the variation across districts better. More than half the kids in the state of Texas, just because of the income distribution of Texas, um, fall below that free or reduced price lunch line. So when you use free or reduced lunch across schools in Texas, you have a whole lot of schools that are simply 80 to 100 percent free or reduced lunch, yet you know that there's real variation in the economic circumstances of kids across those schools, and you want to pick that up in the weighting system. And when you use a lower income threshold, when you use a more stringent measure of poverty, that's also likely, when we move to the next step of looking at costs, lead to a, a bigger weight on more severe poverty. Right? So all of these steps have to be kind of taken together. We want to do this risk analysis to come up with measures that predict differences in outcomes, figure out what's, what measure is working best. Um, and we, were gonna, we did this ultimately with school level data that were Vermont, largely Vermont sourced data, district level data that were Vermont sourced data. And we went into this with a concern that the second stage of this is to estimate these kind of excessively complicated cost models. And to get a cost model to kind of meet all of the statistical requirements it has to meet, sometimes you have to make sure, every time, you have to make sure you have enough variation in the data, that there's variation across the settings and schools and districts and in the outcomes that they achieve. So we built into the analysis doing a separate model based on a new study that, that the first version of which I produced about a year ago, the new version is coming out in February, where I had estimated a national education cost model with this new data set out of Stanford, the Stanford Education Data Archive, where they kind of equated all of the district outcome measures for every district in the country. They took state assessment data and did some statistical tricks to make it comparable, norming it against NAEP scores. There are some issues with those data, for sure. Um, but it's better than having nothing. Um, and if and, I may interject, yes. I want to I really stress something that Bruce is saying here. Right, so what Bruce and, and, and did, along with, with AIR and the team, yeah. is instead of just looking at Vermont, right, because Vermont's quirky, right. we, we, know, we hear about Vermont, the uniqueness of Vermont, but you know, when we, when, when we approached this study, we wanted to make sure that the cost factors and the measures certainly worked in Vermont, but that we could validate them with national it, 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 data. Yeah. And one of the strengths of this study is that we were able to triangulate all of these findings, not just in Vermont, and verify them with regional and national data. So what you're seeing in our findings are not some idiosyncratic Vermont phenomena, right? We end up using the Vermont models and Vermont findings, but we triangulated those findings to verify them with regional and national data. Exactly. And we're able to do that because Bruce has these unique data sets that allows us to do that. And I think that's really important to know, and I want to just point that yeah. out. What we did was we, we set up, a, and I didn't want to do it off the national model because there's just a whole lot of variation nationally that might not be as directly comparable to Vermont. Um, so I set up a model that used data from Western you know, Massachusetts, Massachusetts, except for the Boston <coughs> Metro, so Western Mass, New Hampshire, and Maine. I had upstate New York in it, but there were problems with the New York State data. Um, there are a lot of interesting kind of features to the, to the kind of rural population decline and other you know, things about upstate New York, Western Mass, and Northern New Hampshire that are much more similar to Vermont than, than elsewhere. Um, what, what I was most concerned about in fitting the Vermont only models were things like picking up a, 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 a stable kind of viable weight for, for English language learners because we have such, kind of, so few pockets mm -hmm. of concentrated English language learners in Vermont by adding in Western Mass, picking up places like Holyoke and Springfield, um, and other towns, kind of through the um, mill towns in, in New Hampshire that have seen dramatic influx of English language learners. I was able to capture a little more variation to, I think, get a kind of a, a more stable and valid um, estimate for English language learners that we go on and use later in the recommendations. So it's, it was nice to be able to do a school level model with Vermont data. Actually, have a work, one of the things you worry about in trying to estimate at this second stage a statistical model where we're relating existing spending data, outcome data, with consideration for all these different cost factors based on the measures we selected in the first step. So we get this statistical model that then tells us well, how much more for each unit change in low income kids.
is the expenditure associated with achieving this outcome goal? How much more with respect to ELL kids is the expenditure associated with achieving this outcome goal? And we actually then also throw in corrections for what might be differences in the efficiency of that expenditure. Um, and, and then even how do those things interact in a model where we're also considering how much more does it cost to be in a school with 100 or with 50 <coughs> kids in an area that has 300 residents per square mile versus 100 versus 50 versus 10. Um, so we build that all into this model, um, which becomes rather complicated. All the, the tables of that are in the report where you can see, well, what are the differences Differences in, in costs associated with moving from 0 to 100% low income, from 0 to 100% ELL, or 0 to 100% um, on any other, as well as moving across different size categories of school. Because we know that model itself becomes complex just to meet the statistical requirements. There's certain kind of tests a model has to pass. To, uh, to meet the requirements of being a good and valid statistical model. We then want to be able to kind of boil that down into something that's reasonable for policy. You could conceivably take the predicted cost values for the model and back out from that just, in, uh, just a general equalized pupil count. And that this is how much more it costs in Rutland than, than in Rutland Town or in, in Winooski than in Burlington to achieve common outcome goals. You could take it with a global measure and boil it down to uh, an equalized pupil count and back out the tax rates from there. But we you know, know that there's a whole lot of kind of black box aspect to that. So we then took it the next step to fitting kind of simplified models in this weight estimation where we take, well, what are the factors that we would actually just be using in the formula? What's the low income pupil count we'd use in the formula? the ELL count we'd use in the formula, and some district size groupings and sparsity groupings, and use what we would have in a formula to predict the cost predictions from the cost model. And we can predict those with over 90% accuracy with a simplified model. So we thought, well, okay. and, and with something then that's actually usable and interpretable as, as policy. So that's this next step. We estimate these complicated models. We come up with cost predictions for each, for each school or each district in the state or even in the region. And then we move to just looking at the specific measures that might be used in weighting in the formula and predicting the cost predictions from the cost model to come up with well, how much more in dollar terms and then in weight terms does it cost to get common outcomes across the range of poverty in Vermont schools and districts, across the range of ELL students in Vermont schools and districts. And then the next step is to kind of work that all backwards into a, a tax rate calculating uh, simulation, which was done largely by, uh, by Drew Atchison uh, with American Institutes for Research. So, so uh, yeah, we covered, yeah, I think I We'll just skip that. I think he yeah. covered all of that. So let's move on to slide 23. So out of all that, what did we find? Well, we found that things that you know we, we know tend to affect cost, affect cost, but we were able to generate some kind of you know some useful insights um, as to um, how much you know how we could construct a weight for economically disadvantaged students based on the measures currently used, I think, at district level in Vermont, even though our best cost model had used school level measures, we were able to create a bridge between the two and use an economically disadvantaged measure based on the existing district measure. We, we had more variation in what we saw in our cost models on the estimates related to the costs associated with English language learners, but I think the greatest confidence in those areas where we had the greatest variation, which was in the regional model. Almost everything else that we use um, in our policy guidance is from the Vermont school level model. But we also were able to pick up some of the differences. Now, we are not, when, when we look at these kind of differences in middle school and secondary grades, um, the way we had looked at it in our models, knowing that there are various configurations of schools out there, is to look by the, the proportion of students in certain grade ranges. Um, that's something that Drew and Jesse and I have come to 
after doing enough years of this and trying to come up with variables that identify the K-5 school, the K-6 school, the 3-8 school, the 4-7, and all the different configurations, it was easier to try to come up with a more uniform measure. Um, and one that can still be used directly in policy. What proportion of kids are in this grade range? What proportion in this grade range? Uh, but these differences that we see by grade range are not still in our mind necessarily cost factors. They are, they're still, I, they pop up in these models as differences in expenditure based on the grade distribution of students. But to a large extent, you know, we don't, we don't know, for example, if we were to have invested more in the early grades, we'd be, we'd be getting better outcomes in the upper grades. There may be some differences, and, and we tend to see those grade range adjustments more often than not reflect historical practice, which is a little different than when, we, because they're not as tightly linked with the outcome measures directly as poverty or ELL status. So the grade range thing is a little fuzzier, but the geographically, the, the, the population density and school size factors were highly consistent with other, uh, with other analyses in, in economies of scale and population sparsity. Um, these are the, 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 when we boiled it down to, to weights um, through that second stage of the analysis to then be used in our simulations, um, we, we came down to you know, a set of weights that were significantly larger for child poverty. But we had already known that. Even, even back, like a lot of states, one of the most common ways that states go about adopting their poverty weights is what our other states do. This state just did that, this state just, that's how we came up with these 20 and 25 percent weights. By the mid to late 90s, there started to be emerging evidence that, well, it was anywhere between, you know, 50 and 150 percent based on different analyses that were being done in, in academic work. So a number of states started moving to like 40 percent weights. We don't quite have enough money to get to the 50, and we're certainly not going to the 100s, so we're going to the 40. Um, Few states have jumped to actually directly using kind of cost modeling analysis. Kansas has used cost modeling analysis to directly inform its policy. Um, and Texas had used cost modeling analysis, but they had not, it didn't result in substantial policy change. They were going about that around the year 2000. Um, the Kansas one, they did a study in 2006, um, which informed policy reforms, which were then undermined by the recession. And they just went back and did another study in 2018 using cost modeling, which is likely to guide the changes down the line. Um, and that second one comes out with weightings that are more in line with uh, even what we've come out with here. Um, so we, we take two approaches here that <coughs> Tammy is going to address a little bit more, um, because we know that special education is ultimately treated separately in policy. But our first set of models, you know, we, we actually run two sets of models, one that includes high incidence, low severity, and low incidence, high severity special ed students in the cost model. And when you run that model, because there's a relationship between disability concentration and poverty, you get significant weight on disability concentration, which then eats up some of the weight on poverty, and when we pull that out, see, if you wanted to have a, a kind of a, a, a consistent overall school finance policy, you'd want to make sure that you're capturing the full collective effects. So if you pull out the special ed and don't separately weight it for the poverty concentration or the other weightings that might interact with it, then those have to go back in the other, or vice versa. So knowing that these were separate policy considerations, that they were likely to remain that way, we then went and ran the models with and without special ed students in the cost model and in the weighting model so that we could move those kind of conflated adjustments around, move it into special ed, taking it out of the general, or move it back into the general, taking it out of the special ed. And I think I'll tip it over to Tammy there. It, it creates a policy choice, right? And so just to recap what Bruce just said, so when you look at these cost factors, these cost factors were empirically derived, right? We didn't say, well, these are the cost factors we think there are. These were empirically derived from these, from these models. 
to say these are the things that account for differences in costs across districts. But we also know that one of the things that accounts for differences across difference in costs across districts is special education students, right? But we have a categorical program for special education students, and so if we include them in the weights, we double count, right? So we have to think about that. So there, there are two. Po there's a policy decision, right? And the policy decision is with respect to any potential adjustment in differences in costs associated with students with disabilities. We could do that through the census block grant, right? Adjust the grant amount. Or we could adopt a different set of weights that implicitly adjust for differences in, special, in the incidence of special education students, right? Across the students, right? And they're different models, like we said. The models, are, the models help us do that. But that's really the fork in the road, right? Is that you have a choice. Policymakers have a choice. If you are interested in adjusting, right, in addressing potential differences, cost differences, we could either do this implicitly through the equalized people calculation by choosing a set of weights that incorporate some of that variation in the weights you select, or you could choose not to adjust at all, and, or adjust specifically over on the census grant side, right? And so, so the, what was that? Clarification. Yeah. Which color? I'm just going to go there. So. Because it's a little confusing. With yeah. That. So, 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 column number two. Here, here's, here's the cheat sheet. Column number two is the column of weights that if you want to implicitly adjust the equalized people calculation for differences in student aid associated with the incidence of students with disabilities. Okay? But if you do that, you should not make an adjustment to the census block grant for that because you've double counted, okay? If, right, if the policy decision is to either do nothing, right, or wait, right, on making any adjustments to the census block grant right now, or to adjust the census block grant, it's column number three, okay? Because that model controls for students with disabilities and that's how the regression works, <coughs> okay? Go ahead, Peter. Just a very quick clarification. Yeah. Uh, the, like, let's just say line one, uh, the existing weight is 0.25. Yep. It's really, it, it's one plus 0.25. So, right. so it is one plus 0.25, and if, but we, the if you do that, not. then you have to add one to those two other numbers, right? Yeah. These numbers are, yes. Yes. What? Yeah. They would like that to be comparable. Okay. So, and the reason the 0.25 is listed is if you look in statute, it says 0.25. Right, but that's multiplied by something, and so what we wanted to do to eliminate the potential for confusion around what would actually go in statute, the num if you were to adopt column three, right, those are the numbers that would go in statute that are comparable with the numbers that you have in statute now with the calculation. And if you look at the report, there's a detailed table that walks through step by step by step the equalized people calculation that we have now and exactly how these weights could be incorporated in their values. Okay? So, if we, if so that's why that's like that. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, so if we were to adopt <coughs> line one, uh, column three, yeah. you would count a student who fell into that category really as 3.97, not as 2.97. That's correct, but the number that would go in statute is 2.97, yes. that would be the multiplier, yes. okay? So a couple other things I want to do. So you have a fork in the road, right, for deciding, right, column two or column three with regard to weights. A couple other things to point out here is, as Bruce mentioned, we ran models using district data, school data, regional data. All the models triangulated, right, but they're all a little different. In our evaluation, and each of them create a different set of weights, right, in our professional judgment, the, the weights that are derived from the school level models, which is what you see here, are the recommended weights. And when I say recommended, I mean recommended across the th different model configurations. Okay? We're being very careful. We're not making a recommended policy recommendation, but if you right, if you look at the different models, these are the weights that we feel are in the strongest on the strongest from an imperial. The other thing you have to keep in mind with these weights is that you have to think about the weights in terms of columns. And what do I mean by that? That means because the weights are derived from a regression model where you have all these other things in them, the minute you start, all the weights are conditioned on each other. So you can't just say, oh, I like 2.97 and 0.2. No, you can't do that. So you have to think of these as packages. 
And that makes sense, right? Because what you're trying to do is create comprehensive or cohesive policy, right? And the minute you start picking and choosing specific weights, you unwind that because the models weren't developed that way. And nor should policy, right? We need to think about this as, as, as a system, and we have to think about this comprehensively. So when you start to think about this, this table, or other tables that might be generated, you have to think about columns. And those columns are not, right, are the weighted values, but also the rows. And the rows are the things that you include as cost factors. And so all of those weights are conditioned on, on the fact that those cost factors are also included in the model. Does that, does that, does that okay, make sense? What we can do, why don't yeah. we just flag this as one that we might need to come back yeah, to? Yeah, that's fine. I just want to make yeah. sure that people yeah. understand. There will, as I said, there will be lots of questions that come up, but those are some big guideposts. Yeah. As you start, well, maybe go back and read things, those are some important guideposts to help work through that. What slide number is that? We don't have numbers. Okay. Um, that is slide number 24. It's also the same table that's in the executive summer. Okay? Um, I talked about fork in the road, right? So you can, you can think about... If, you, if policymakers are inclined to adjust for differences in special education, you can do it implicitly through the weights, or you can right, wait and see, right? Or if you decide to do something now, you also can adjust the census grant calculation. There are two ways you can adjust that calculation. If you think about the calculation, it's some fixed dollar amount times the number of students in a district. So you've got two policy levers you can pull here. I can adjust the dollar amount per student, or I can adjust the student count. One of the things that we talked about in the report that predated, so preceded Act 173, is we actually talked about maybe a way of adjusting the dollar amount. There was a lot of sort of consternation around that. And I'll, I'll, I'll refer to Representative Beck because I think in the committee meeting when we talked about it, you made a really important point, which was you set cliffs, right? That just gets really complicated. You lose the predictability and transparency in the formula because every year trying to figure out what the dollar amount is. And one of the strengths, even among stakeholders who may not be strong supporters of the grant program, is that the predictability and transparency is, is actually really valued. And so our recommendation is if you decide to adjust the grant amount, that you don't tinker with the dollars, you think about how can we adjust the pupil count. And there are two options that we propose. Again, these were based on stakeholder input as well as empirical analysis. Option one is to take that flat grant amount, also known as the unified base amount in statute, and multiply it by the number of equalized pupils in a district. Right? It's pretty straightforward. It's predictable for school districts. It ties, right? It presumes that the weights used in the equalized pupil calculation are capturing the vari variation in student need. Right? <coughs> Option two <coughs> excuse me, is to multiply the unified base amount by the poverty weighted pupil count. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> this one yeah. so this, this one derives from the fact that we, we have a figure in the report, I don't know if you remember, <coughs> where we, we show, and I think you've shown this in other reports, that there is in particular uh, a significant relationship between disability concentration <coughs> and concentration across uh, Vermont districts. So that probably the, the one area of greatest overlap, but if, if you were to only adjust by the poverty weighted count and not the fully equalized people count, you're missing the possibility that special ed costs might also be influenced by scale, sparsity, and, and overlay with ELL, for example. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's a, certainly a stronger relationship with, with poverty, um, but taking that particular approach assumes that the special education costs don't vary with respect yeah. to the other factors. So the equalized people count multiplying by that would be a more generous adjustment than the poverty related adjustment. You'll notice that the unified base amount changes for the poverty. That's just because in order to stick with legislative intent, which is to stick within a specific appropriation, because the poverty weighted counts not equalize back to the number of students in the state, the same, right? You have to do that, and by doing that, it, because it's not, you have more pupils, and so you just have a bigger denominator. And so it's not that that reduces the it's not that that reduces the overall appropriation. It just we have to right size that because we have a higher pupil count. That's all. So you have two options, right? Well, you have three options, well, four options, right? You have you can do 
right? You can do nothing. If you do something, here are some ideas about how you can do that, and we simulate these options in the back of the report so you can kind of get a flavor for what this might look like, okay? Question clarification. Um, when you're talking about uh, using the weights, um, the equalized pupil count or the poly weight of pupil count, are you talking about the weights you just put in that other Great chart, question. In or the ones we have now? Does it really both. matter? Both. Both? How can you do both? So what we do, <laughs> let me tell you, it's like a Gensu night Not at the same time. Yeah, not at the yeah. same you time. Have one, we only have right. them once. How well, what we did in the simulations in the back, Right? What we do in the simulations in the back, and I flip forward, is we offer simulations that do all these different ways. Yeah, I look at those, I don't understand. Yeah. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold that. I, 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 I have a question, but we, we'll do this in committee. Yeah. 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 I know, but I can't understand the rest of what she's going to say without understanding <coughs> how she's doing both at once. So I'll leave right now. Well, we're not doing both at once. You right? just said you were doing both. No, what I said was is that we calculate, we do the simulations a number of different ways, right? What's in that chart when it says equalized pupil count? Is that what we have now? Yep. Or is that so option one on the other? Option list? one is when we do the simulations, it's broken out into option 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3, right? So we use it, the existing fiscal year equalized pupil count for option 1.1. Option 1.2 uses the weights. That we propose. Option 1.3 uses the weights we propose with the substitution of the ELL. Okay. 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 So okay. it is. We but do that do doesn't do. show in the No, chart, no, so no. We no. don't intentionally I it's do that here. Or or <laughs> these are distinct okay. options, okay. Okay. and then we calculate the different ways okay. for the purpose of the simulation. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so we've talked about the simulations a bunch already, right? Um, we're not going to go into specific simulations in the back. I think that's for committee. And, and but what we do, did, and I just did uh, here, is familiarize your, the, the, the group with how you can look at those simulations, right? And the simulations are intended to show how the cost factors and weights derived from our empirical analysis might be integrated in Vermont's existing school funding formula. We have two scenarios, right? Column two, column three, that you just saw, in terms of the weights. And this table summarizes that. We manipulate one thing, and Dr. Baker mentioned this, is given that we have a relatively small ELL population in the state, we do change out and use, in some of the simulations, the regional ELL weight. And that is the column, that's the row highlighted in yellow. You can see how we use that. But each one of these simulations shows you the weights that we use, and you can look at it. Each corresponds to an appendix of the report that show you exactly the impact of those changes on the equalized pupil count for the districts. We also simulate the tax rates. However, in, the value, in looking at that particularly, it changes in tax rates. I want to be really clear. That presumes, right, fiscal year 18 spending, both within that district and statewide, the base slash yield that the state established for fiscal year 18, right? So it's a retrospective application to existing data. So the reason I say that is I don't want, I, I would be, I, I get concerned that people are going to sort of get ourselves tied up in conversation about micro changes in tax rates because these are really illustrative, and they are conditioned on these sort of assumptions about what happened in a year past. We all know that that's not going to be what happens this year on town meeting day. So again, it gives you a sense. I think when you look at those simulations, what is more powerful is to understand what does that do to the equalized pupil count in my town or district and the percentage change. And, and it's also important to note that they, are, that they are conditioned on the choices of specific measures that we've used in determining those equalized pupil counts. Right. right? That, that all of that is, is subject to some shift in, in the actual kind of policy choices in determining but what is, is the exact version of this measure to be used, the timing of its collection, and, and so on. And, and all of that will lead to subtle changes. Yeah. Um, it presumes that 
these weights and these cost factors are used and applied retrospectively. Okay. And again, it, the simulations are still a powerful tool for decision making and understanding, but what I don't want to, what, what I want to caution people is if you go back to your constituents or you hear from your constituents that it, this is the precise number and this is what, that's not exactly the correct interpretation, right? That's to give you, it's really supposed to illustrate what it would look under, what that would look like under a very specific set of conditions. And we were having too much fun just giving one or two yeah, options, yeah, yeah. and we had to throw a few we asked bells for, and whistles. By in. the way, the the uh, the, con the RFP issued by AO, we asked for six. We narrowed down to four, so hopefully that's it. Makes it a little less confusing that way. Okay, we talked about the special institution <laughs> and block grants. So how do you put this all together? Right? So we've given you a lot of information, a lot of pieces, the reports two pages long. We've got maybe a flow chart that sort of lays this out in terms of decision making might be useful. And as and also as a way to wrap up. Is there's an initial question, right? Do policy makers want to incorporate new cost factors and weights and equalize pupil calculations? If the answer is no, I think it's time to recess for lunch. Right? <laughs> if the answer is yes. Your next question is, well, what weights slash cost factors do we use? We've offered you in our report a set of recommended weights of out of our models, right? In that table that Bruce talked you through. And you have a choice of, right, column two or column three. And column two explicitly adjusts for differences in special ed. The other one says we're going to do that over on this thread. So if you follow our report logic, your next choice would be column two or column three. If you take the weights that implicitly adjust for differences in students with disabilities across districts, then there's no need to move on to the additional decision, which is do we adjust the census block grant? If you take column three, right, which has the weight where you have it implicitly, your next decision is, okay, do we adjust the grant? If it's yes, you have options one and two, right, which are conditioned on how you calculate equalized people, right? And your decision there is, well, do we use an equalized, do we, do we change the count of students in, that we use in our census grant calculation of an equalized people or are poverty weighted versus the existing ADM? Okay. So this, the idea is to sort of lay it out. Now, there will be variations on this, but hopefully that gives you sort of a roadmap for thinking where are the key decisions and what is the sequence of those decisions that we need to be made? So, some key, just to recap, some key conclusions. Vermont's approach to adjusting for differences in educational costs across school districts has remained relatively unchanged for 20 years. Stagnation in the state's education funding policies is a source, has been, and is a source of concern. Existing policies are, vote, are viewed as wide, uh, widely viewed as outdated and falling short of equalizing educational costs across school districts and, by extension, opportunities to learn for students across the state. The manner in which the state currently calculates the number of equalized pupils in a school district has been criticized for being out of step with contemporary educational conditions. And existing funding programs also fail to recognize significant shifts in the state's educational policies and practices. For example, flexible pathways, early college, post new challenges. Findings from this study suggest that it's time to incorporate new cost factors, those are the things we wait on, and weights for those things in Vermont's education funding formula. The findings suggest that the existing weights for economically disadvantaged DLL students fall short appropriately adjusting for the cost of educating these students to standards, that we need new cost factors for school size and population density, and that these could replace the existing small schools grant program, and that refining the secondary school rate to include a middle level and a secondary level adjustment, as opposed to right, lumping everything together to 7 to 12, might better align weights with educational policy and practice. Finally, that modifying the equalized pupil calculation may not translate and increase levels of spending in districts with higher need. The additional tax capacity generated by a higher equalized pupil count may be seen as an opportunity to reduce taxes rather than close spending and opportunity gaps. And then there's a need for new categorical standards for student mental health and trauma-based 
Thank you so I much. It's a big report. I know we're going to be hearing from the secretary as well after. Correct. You, I, I wasn't planning on. You were. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, and, okay. I think your presentation is much more comprehensive. Okay. Yeah. So then, what's our time limit for departure? You okay? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think we will open it up for questions. questions. I know um, Representative Austin, you had a question. Yep. I have a couple. Just two questions. Oh. Um, I'm wondering if there's any data that shows that addressing poverty would uh, address the needs of um, children with reduced lunch, as opposed to addressing them in school, addressing poverty. S certainly there is, uh, you know, in terms of data on housing policy, I mean, you know, it's really interesting, you know, so much of it goes on, so like trying to translate like the, the research on housing policy vouchers in Manhattan to mm -hmm. Vermont. There, there's a large body of research um, in broader Kind of public policy management that focuses on housing policy, transportation policy, um, food security, all of these other factors that are, you know, could be addressed in a more comprehensive overall policy strategy um, that we often find ourselves in, in our narrower field trying to then compensate for through wading through the school funding formula. Right. And in the, so the weights that we come up with are weights that are necessary in the context of the existing broader social policy of Vermont. Um, could you change, it be a fun, geeky academic study for me, if you change those contextual policy structures and we go back and rerun these models, do we see that the weights have gone down for poverty because we've better addressed it elsewhere? And then it's also a virtue of this strategy is that updating the analyses and data given policy changes is not incredibly difficult um, to do. So we can test whether policy changes result in different weight structure changes and recalibrate formulas, I think, more easily than we can with other methods. If I might add something, I think you know it's also like your your question also raises a question of tax policy too, right? So when we have health and human services programs, those are funded out of the general education fund. They're not funded out of the ed fund. And to the extent that those those programs and policies and practices are underfunded or have had cuts, the schools still need to serve struggling students who come in, right? They're still responsible. And so what you see is the schools having to put in place um, washer and dryers, mental health services, things that they might historically have received in the community. And those are additional education costs. Well, the Ed Fund pays for those, <coughs> which comes out of property taxes. What comes out, right? So, I mean, this is actually a question. There's a taxation question embedded in, in, your, in your remark as well, right? Which is, to the extent that the general fund is underfunding health and human services that are necessarily for strong families and communities and students, that doesn't mean that students still don't have needs, right? If they can't access those services outside of school, but the schools, in order to ensure that the school is a safe place of learning, students can achieve common outcomes, they're having to spend more. And we hear that we've heard this over and over and over again in this study around mental health and trauma, right? Food. Well, those those increased costs in school budgets are funded a fundamentally different way. They're paid for with different dollars, right? And so it's I think it's I think we also have to think about we're, how are we paying for those services? Are we paying on the general ledger? Or are we paying for them by the end of month? The other question ties into um, where has it been determined that schools would pick up the cost of mental health and impact of trauma? I mean, that's to me a health issue. I mean, I feel like that. I don't know that anyone's determined that. I think that what you see is caring, competent educators in the field are responding to emergent and immediate student needs around safety, around um, student mental health, but you know those are directly related to educational outcomes too, right? And so I think you know this is a you know, this is a systemic question um, that far that goes far beyond waiting in this particular study. But we certainly in our stakeholder interviews heard these kinds of sentiments come up across not just from our educators in the field, but you know. Maybe it, it, it bubbles up all over the place. Right. 
The school's on train to address mental health. Some of these questions I yeah. think we can answer okay. in the committee. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Representative Young. Um, I mean, obviously, the, it is like a really significant difference between the poverty factor. I'm wondering what percentage of Vermont students are in poverty that would be weighted at that level? On the measure that we used for the simulation guide, that's what I don't recall. Can you give me a minute? I can look yeah. that up. I just want to be precise. The other thing is, is to remember is that difference by district. Yes, so of course. Just on, on average, overall. how many are going to yeah. generate that much weight? Yeah, yeah. Right. 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 yeah I was just uh, the one yeah. comment I'd make, uh, just in terms of the question and answer. We'll we'll be spending time in the next several weeks uh, providing just the baseline information about this report and committees. Right. So if you if you have further information, Dr. Foley's agreed to be available, and we'll be planning to do that as best we can to educate everyone on just what's in the report. Thank you. Uh, well, one thing I want to point out that I have a question uh, is that, for example, I went, as many of us probably did, when we looked at the uh, impact on our own schools that we might represent, and I found, for example, in the tables covering ruralness and population density, none of the very rural small schools that I represent. And I just think it's important to point out that um, the information really um, cuts to a point in time when some districts were unified, some were not. Uh, and that um, I assume that, that for, if we were to sort of use that to adopt policy, we might need more updated information as to how that all checks out. Absolutely. I mean, that's, uh, what we've done is we've, we've you, you'd want to come up with, you know, when it comes to the sparse population sparsity measure, the size measure, the size measure is really just enrolled pupils. Uh, but you need the most recent and you need a comprehensive version and you need something that's a, a, at least a directly comparable to what we've tried to model on if you're going to use it as a cost factor. But you're going to have to figure out for legislation purposes what are the exact data and measures that would be used and will cover all districts and will be you know, updatable in a timely enough fashion to run the formula each year. Um, so yeah, we're basically able here to provide illustrations with the best available data we had retrospectively through 2018. And we're already in 2020 now. So. And to Representative Collins' point, also, just the population density measure that we're applying is the population density of the district in which the school resides. So it's not the population de density of the school. And the reason for that is, is under Act 46 with the Unified Governance, it, right, that the idea is that it's a sparsely populated district, and this is a school that's located within that district. That also might be. Right, although right. we still have some schools that power on it that can even be single schools, yep. single districts. That's right, that's right. right. That, that gets at the F46. But so I want to be clear that the population density measure is the population density of the district in which a school. So this is a, a more global assessment of population density than it is a more micro one. Yeah. So, and so my question is better, more specific. On the recommended uh, weight tables, uh, you had said you know you really need to adopt the full column. Yep. Uh, as policy, so what if you were to pull a row out? Like, let's say we decided ELL should really be something that's supported with categorically rather than uh, with a student weight. Would that? How does that change a policy decision? I, I would argue that the kind of the basis for funding that separately would have to be derived from a calculation back back out off the weight. Um, yeah. If we wanted to approach ELL funding separately from the outset, the strategy we could have taken empirically in the process would be analogous to what we did for special ed. Can we estimate separate models not accounting for ELL to see how ELL and poverty are, are overlapping so that we can roll some of that back into the poverty way and equalize people count and take the rest out in this separate ELL block? Um, I think it's problematic to try to take something like ELL out um, because of the way these things do fit together. Um, arguably, it can be a little problematic because of the overlay of special ed and poverty, but I think we came up with a fairly useful strategy for either keeping that effect in the equalized people count or adjusting uh, the special ed block. Yeah, I guess the, with ELL, it's such a... Uh, Peter. Uh, all right, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. 
We'll take it to our committee room. <laughs> Representative Till. Um, thank you for a very nice presentation and a very interesting report. Um, <clears throat> I want to say also thank you for uh, the suggestion of the categorical aid for mental health and trauma. I think our schools have become much more trauma-informed over the last 10 years, and I, I, I think that they are eager to do more. Um, and um, I think that that is such a huge need, and whether you're funded, like, you know, we fund Medicaid to schools for other health stuff. I mean, it doesn't have to come out of the fund. It's just, you know, it's, it just should be done. Um, I was confused a little bit about your geographical necessity definition. Okay. I'm thinking you can't get from point A to point B in the winter because the mountain pass is yeah. closed. You guys are, seem to be thinking about density of the population. Yeah, so that's a really fair question. And certainly that's something that if you sort of what the state board was considering. So there are lots of different ways to think about um, rurality, right? And, 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 and the additional cost of operating schools in sort of geographically challenged areas. And certainly other states have tried to do that. I think when we were looking through this, our goal was to identify, as Bruce was talking about, measures that are, that, that are first of all, capture the variation well, right? But we also need reliable and valid measures that can be replicated over time and easily data or easily collected and maintained. The population density measure is something that the Agency of Education has created and is using in their, in their work right now. And so it's something that's maintained in terms of, in terms of an indicator. It also, in our models, captures the variation really well. Does that not mean that, that another indicator could be used? Yes, that's true. But you know, ours was a judgment call as to something that was transparent, something that we that was reliable, valid in terms of measure, knowing that we were measuring what we were measuring, and we could do it in a consistent way over time, and something that could be generated by the agency in per perpetuity without sort of new resources. We I mean, have these gen generalizable available measures with which to fit the model, and we can't necessarily model anecdote of it, but that's not to say that policy shouldn't account for it. That's actually something I ran into in a study in Wyoming, because that, that exact problem was, well, yes, but you can't cross the mountain pass between, you know, October and, uh, and March. So those, obviously, there are going to be policy considerations that go above and beyond the generalizable formula. Um, and you just got to figure out what are going to be the decision bases on which those are going to be made. I don't know how many schools to which that would apply. That, that, um, yeah, I mean, it's more about the small good. schools grants yeah. than anything else. And then if I could ask you one last one. What outcomes are we trying to equalize? When you were aiming all of your things at equalizing outcomes, what are the outcomes you're trying to We equalize? had to, I and mean, this is one of the really frustrating things on the statistical modeling side of this, is we have to work with that which is consistently measured across schools and districts and students. So our models are fit to achieving equal outcomes on state assessment scores. We wanted to be able to broaden that to graduation rate, for, you know, had ideally a system where you're collecting data on persistent, persistence and completion into higher ed. Yeah. Um, that'd be great. It'd be really nice to estimate a model that has a richer set of outcomes or to estimate models across multiple outcomes. In those cases where I've had some opportunity to broaden the outcome measures, the patterns of variation across communities still tend to be relatively consistent where the outcomes are still within the scope of academic and graduation rate, persistence, completion, and so on, average test scores in reading and math tend to be at least somewhat statistically predictive of those things. So given these kind of links, you know, when at, at that level of aggregation, that's not to say that we can go to the level of any one child and say they got this <coughs> test score, they're going to make it or they're not. That's a totally different level of judgment call, um, something I've written very critically about in a lot of my work. But um, at that level of aggregation, at school and district level, we do tend to see that where poverty is, is higher and leads to a risk of lower test scores, the associated risk of lower graduation rate or lower college attendance is relatively similar. So these things do line up, so 
it kind of works, but it's really unfortunate that we've spent so much of our time only measuring reading and math test scores for third through eighth graders for so many years. So, thank you. Uh, I think. Um, I'm looking at simulation E1, so I do have a question about that. Related to the weights, uh, my understanding is E1 corresponds with column 3. Uh, so, with, with controls for the share of SWVs. As I look at that compared to the current weighting, so if, if as Representative McConnell was saying, it says 0.25 in statute, we think of it as 1.25, right, status quo. Uh, so, 3.97 would be the equivalent. So that is more than a three-fold increase in terms of the weighting for an economically disadvantaged student. Now, logically to me, that feels like it would increase the equalized pupil count in any district where you had students with economic disadvantage. Now, of course, in P1, we see that's not the case. In fact, the town that I live in has a, we're between 30 and 40 percent, I believe, students who would fit in that category. And, and our equalized pupil estimate, estimate goes up by 1 percent. So what I'm trying to understand is what are the factors in that column that are um, taking away? Because I know that some of them are mul multiplicative, some are additive, but there must be some factor that is reducing pupil counts. Remember that the equalized pupil count, right? So, so there are two different things going on here. So I think what you're, I think what I'm hearing you talk about is what your weighted pupil count would obviously mm -hmm. go up, right? Right. But remember that then everybody's weighted pupil count, and then we equalize it down to the total population and so it becomes sort of this proportionate mm -hmm. response. So what that suggests to me, and I, I haven't looked at your specific time, is that although you went up, you didn't go up as much as others. Right? Right? right. They, right? Because it's because of the e with equalization works, right? So, so if you go up to three hundred, yeah. right? But when you see goes up goes up even more, right? Remember that all gets sort of deflated back down to the actual ADM, and so it becomes, what is your proportionate share of the overall? <coughs> the average the right. Right. The, the, the poverty, the, the much higher poverty weight is, is going to, in, in relative position, move the higher poverty districts higher on the equalized people count. But in absolute position, now there's much higher because we deflate the whole thing back down to the zero sum. And is that deflation categorized in like a coefficient somewhere in your It's report? in the simulation. It's actually one of the cells. If, if you scroll through the calculated columns, you'll see that the deflation factor, it might be the bottom cell in that upper left box, if I'm picturing it right. It's like a 0.54 or something like that. It's a spreadsheet where you can actually enter these things. But you know, the deflation oh, factor is, yeah. it varies by year. Right. And this is something that Brad James calculates in Like This is an issue every single year. Right? We equal lot. We create this long-term weighted PK-12 ADM that where we get this number of students that far exceeds what we actually have, and then we've got to deflate it down proportionally using, as Bill Talbot language, the factor, the factor. right? The factor, <laughs> right? And so that factor changes every year, but it changes every year depending on what the total number, the total count is, and so that's that's why you see that, and it feels like okay, well we went up, but Shouldn't we've gone up more low? It's all relative. Okay, thanks. Does that help? That does help, okay. thank you, yeah. Other questions? Um, yeah. yeah. Just this last exchange um, got me thinking about something different. Um, I understand that a lot of schools may be upset with their relative position adopted versus unadopted. Um, Trauma on school board. But what I think what you just said was factors can change from, I should use the same word twice, the number, the calculation could change from year to year based on the factor. The factor may the change. The relative position, if, if you were to right. adopt our weights right. as policy, they're going to drive the relative position. Understood. Um, right? Now, your absolute position once we, now, when you make an abrupt change from current policy weights to our weights, your, the fa your factor is going to, it's going to be harder to interpret what's going on with your change in absolute position. Well, but your relative position is going to be very heavily driven by the poverty weight. Understood. But let me go a little 
what I think was my question. Okay. You gave a good answer. Right. Um, so we changed from last year to next year, and that's right. a big change, and there's an adjustment in shake out. Um, under the under the last year, current, um, school boards know from year to year that um, high school students are worth, worth this much, you know, pre-K this much, da da da, and they can run a calculation and they come up with a number that's, that using those numbers is predictable, right? right. But um, if I understand it, if we collectively adopt your model, A and B and da da da, um, and poverty factors change within school districts from year to year. There's another thing that will move from, right? The, the, the weighted factor will change the outcome as poverty rates go up or down in, in different school districts. Well, there'll be a more abrupt shift than right. what you see now. Right. There's going to be an abrupt initial shift from current policy to new policy. There will be, now if you, if you adopt as part of this, an annualized updating that picks up the drift over time, there will be more subtle shifts from year to year after that. Okay. But they should not be so significant. I mean, poverty does not change itself abruptly okay. one year over the next. That's so those shifts issue. should be subtle moving forward, but abrupt initially if you did it all at once. But as was the case with that one seven. explain what I was trying to get at. Okay. Subtle shifts over time after we do the change. That's right. Right. Now, the interesting twist is because it's all based on then the local decision about how to adjust tax rates. Yeah, yeah. Um, Understood. Then it's, you know. Thank you. That's yeah, good. That so cool. And the other thing to keep in mind is, as was the case with Act 173, there can be a phase in period. Right, like the, this is the, 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 right. This isn't well, yeah. but 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 my point, my point being, and I think you raised a really good point, is that Excuse me, is that Brad James just fainted. Phase <laughs> <laughs> is in the local response. Yeah, the phrase, my my point, my point being is that you raised a good point, right? Is that if any kind of significant shift in the weights is going to, in your point too, is going to create some significant shifts relative, yep. right? Okay. And that's a, that's a relative policy. Thank you. Sorry, Brad. <laughs> Other questions? Tender his resignation. <laughs> it's a national emergency. <laughs> I just wonder. Oh, yes. I wonder if you got the poverty info for Representative Young. I'm going to get back to that number. I'm going to, I, oh, okay. I didn't I'm so excited. Okay. I wrote, I wrote it down. So I okay. I'm going to go to you. I just. I Laptop. I'm floating through and answering questions. I don't want to make a mistake on that. No problem. Because it's all multiplied by the factor at the end. The, yeah. the aggregate cost effect of it is. But uh, what I'll do is I, when I respond, I wrote down that question and also uh, Representative Conlon's question. When I respond, I'll read Representative Webb and Ansel and then she can distribute the response to everybody. Cool. Um, and I'm assuming on the simulations that you, you're, you're assuming the same amount of money. You're not, when you. You're not assuming new money goes into the system. That's exactly right. Right. The, right so this is fiscal zero 18 percent. approved budgets. Right. So this is a zero right. Yeah. This is rearranging deck chairs. Right. right? Like this right. is not. We're not assuming any new money. Right. Right. And part of part of the strength in doing the retroactively is you can see how those shifts would look like. Right. But what happens when school budgets are part past this March? You know, the game starts all over. Okay. And you made, the, I think, the correct point that the fact that um, that uh, school has more poverty and they have lower tax rates doesn't mean they're going to spend that money on better programs for not economically disadvantaged kids. But the flip side of that is that we don't know what would happen in those districts that um, are going to have higher tax rates. That's correct. We don't know if they're going to reduce spending and do less or, you know, sort of what... I mean, there's, more efficient. There's, there's an awful lot of um, uh, guesswork and assumptions and so on about how this might play out, even if it's phased in and Ms. Greg quits. Um, yes. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Touching off of that in, in some way, I mean, given that this is a zero-sum game and, and what it really does is affects tax rates, Right. Um, <coughs> is there, you know, if we looked at addressing some of these issues such as poverty by waiting, are we better off considering it more by categorical grants? It's a policy decision. 
I know, and you don't like to make those. Mm. <laughs> that's, not our, that's not our lane. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting in a context of a yeah. formula that does push it back onto altering the local tax capacity as opposed to setting a target funding level. Could you get around that by funding something directly? Um, I, I think you know, one of the areas that you know, some, some of the research um, in, in my area suggests that the more you allocate as categorical grant, the less efficient expenditures become. Mm -hmm. right? And that's part of the basis for why you know, California finally moved to a unified kind of weighted foundation aid formula as opposed to a wacky array of categorical grants. Categorical grants force the expenditure on certain things and then the administrative structures to monitor the expenditure on certain things in ways that lead to unfortunate inefficiencies, but there is that weird deal here where, well, if, if we put it into the equalized people count, it could just be taken as tax relief and might not be accepted on the programs that are needed. Um, so The other thing to take into account, <laughs> right, when we looked at all those different sort of policy tools, right, capital grants, cat, sort of public finance literature and sort of best practices says that you can use categorical grants for specific and targeted needs, right? So a categorical grant would be for a specific program policy or practice, right? And those grant funds are restricted to that program policy and practice. And so part of the decision there is, is the sort of unpacking what you said, Representative Webb, is if you provide dollars for low-income students, and that's just general aid, that, that that's where it's sort of, it's, it, that's at odds with sort of the, the best practices and sort of how we think about using categorical funding mechanisms wisely in public finance. If it's for a specific program or purpose or policy, then there, there may be some arguments, but, that, but as Dr. Baker said, you know, whenever you segregate funds, you introduce different kinds of bureaucratic and administrative structures. That are, sometimes those are appropriate, sometimes they're not. And they come, right, there's no such thing as a perfect funding formula, right? And so these are the trade-offs you have to weigh. And of course, my question does bring back the fact that Act 173 had to do with moving away from exactly. the categorical grant. It did. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, Peter Anthony. Peter, um, I, maybe it's unfair to ask this, but I, I, I'm using the forum for what present, the opportunity it presents. My community is among the low spenders, and the portrait that you painted about the education institutions, the school board, putting out essentially, a, here's the resources we need given all the things that you said, my frustration as a municipal person and as a debater in this forum, the difficulty is you get that figure, the voters see that figure. How do you get around the "but it won't pass" factor? And and I understand the inefficiency of categorical, but the point is once you strip out some expenditures, then you can get it passed. But you can't get it passed if it's in the general. And I don't know if this is the way in which. Our election laws have said this is the way you must present the question to the voters because I'm not sure people understand ultimately what it costs them when they look at the warning. And that, that's not your problem. But I, I just, it's a frustration of being a low spender and forever being a low spender unless we can get over the it won't pass problem. Is there another question? Well, just real quickly, I'm just wondering in your research, if you found a district, and I don't want to know what, it's, what, what district it is, but that was obtaining very high outcomes, like glaringly or not, you know, surprisingly high outcomes for the amount of poverty in your district, in Vermont. I didn't look. I have a forthcoming study where we're going to be looking at that nationally, I, and we're going to then be digging in to figure, based on the national cost model, mm -hmm. what are the kind of these districts at the boundary that, given their conditions, um, seem to be achieving more than expected or less than expected under the circumstances that they face. And, and the other end of it, we're going to be doing kind of deep dive into a number of districts around the country. On that, I actually don't think in the most recent run of my national model that there are any Vermont districts that popped out on the edges of the national distribution. 
Um, so that I can say, but I intentionally didn't look <laughs> at that because that's one of the really thorny questions because when you start looking at that district and you start looking at the other two. So, <coughs> yeah. Thank and, you. Uh, and, and Secretary French, uh, you are going to be, your, your team is going to be talking with us about the NOOC scores. Yeah, absolutely. Point, and yeah. you can disaggregate some of the data at least on the sure. economic. Yeah, I just on this last conversation, I think it's, uh, when we think about that flow chart and decision making, my, one of my initial reactions to the report is sort of following up on the, the chairs, both chairs, their observations. And we think about where where the policy might break off in this. We have to understand the motivations of how folks make decisions at the local level. And I would argue uh, that the, the equalized pupil uh, function is is brings a different reaction from a budgeting standpoint than the categorical grant. You know, so how districts make decisions around addressing equalized or education spending overall as a function of trying to make cuts or what have you. And then how they use a categorical, or categorical grant to offset their liability on the Ed Fund. Those sort of dynamics around motivation or incentives and behavior are ones that should probably inform which fork of the road we go down in terms of policy. Well, we will each have an opportunity. You, yeah. you are willing to come back uh, as we sort of go into our, our fork. <coughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.